molecular elements and compounds. So when elements combine, um, they could transfer electrons. If that is the case, if, if one of the atoms transfers electrons to another one, what you end up with is an ionic compound. What we're going to be talking about is that some atoms, when they combine, they don't like to lose their electrons. So, so they will combine with other atoms, but they don't want to give up their electrons. So what they end up doing is they will share their electrons. And if atoms are sharing electrons, they form what's called a covalent bond or a shared pair of electrons. And you end up with these particles called molecules. So molecules can be made from the same element. If you take uh, two or, or more of the same element on the periodic table, take two of those atoms or three of those atoms or eight of those atoms, whatever it happens to be. If it's all the same element and they come together, um, as long as they're sharing electrons, these would be called molecular elements. So they are still only made up of one type of atom, even though they're found in groups of more than one. They could be um, found in pairs like oxygen gas, or they could be found in uh, groups of eight like, uh, like sulfur is. Um, whatever the group is, if it's only got one type of atom, it is a molecular element as long as they're sharing electrons. If it happens to be doing something other than sharing electrons, it's not going to be a molecule. So it has to be sharing electrons to be a molecule and molecules can either be made from all the same element or if they're made from different elements, then you end up with a molecular, because it's sharing electrons, compound like water. Some of the properties of these elements, uh, the, the, sorry, the elements, some of them are elements, some of them are compounds. Um, this is a hugely diverse group of particles. And so it's, it's, you can't really narrow down the properties. There are some trends that you see, but there's going to be lots and lots of exceptions as well. So depending on what they are made of, um, how those uh, atoms are sharing electrons, they can exhibit any one of the states, depending on what the temperature is, obviously. Um, but even at a given temperature, you can end up with things that are, are molecules that are solids. You can end up with things that are molecules that are gases. And you can end up with molecules that are liquids as well, all just at room temperature. So it really depends on what type of particle you get. Molecules are very diverse. They tend to have, and again, lots of exceptions, but they tend to have a lower melting point, definitely lower than ionic substances um, and, and things like, like metals and whatnot. But generally speaking, if you had to bet on it, you'd say they probably are going to end up with a low melting point. So there are a fair amount of, of gases and liquids that are molecular solids. Uh, sorry, <laughs> molecular uh, compounds that are not solid. They are there low melting point, so they would be either a gas or a liquid. Um, they tend to have low solubility. So it again, it completely depends on it. So there are a lot that do have low solubility, but some of them will dissolve. It really depends on what. And this is why we are going to be going into some of the particular types of molecules later. Also, little conductivity. This one's a pretty good bet. If you have a, a molecule um, it, it, and you have a group of those molecules, they're probably not going to conduct electricity. So covalent bonding, and again, um, sometimes you'll, you'll see the term uh, molecular bonding, but the idea is that molecules are formed when atoms share electrons. And, and that sharing of electrons is called a covalent bond. So they can refer to as covalent compounds, um, uh, but the, the bond itself is a covalent bond. Molecules are held together by covalent bonds. So non-metals, these are the atoms, and again, you're looking at the top right-hand side of the periodic table, they don't like to lose their electrons. So metals, no problem, they love losing their electrons. But the non-metals don't want to lose their electrons. They tend to have a, a they, they want to hang on to those electrons. They want to gain some more electrons. So these will still want to become stable. So they still want to end up with their full outer shell, but they don't want to lose any electrons. Um, and and they, 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 so they're not going to give them away. They will then, in a lot of cases, they'll end up sharing electrons if they combine with another non-metal. So a shared pair of electrons, again, we refer to that as a covalent bond, and this is what holds molecules together. Atoms share electrons until they have a full outer shell. So they are still trying to become stable, but if they're a molecule, they're doing it through the sharing of electrons, not the transferring of electrons that ionic substances do. So to practice with this, we're going to try using a Lewis dot diagram to show the bonding between a phosphorus and a chlorine. So again, 
we start with our Lewis dot diagram that is going to have your, your symbol in the middle, and then we're going to be putting the valence electrons around it. So since phosphorus is in column 15, it has five valence electrons around it. Um, now chlorine is, it's kind of light, chlorine is in column 17. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it has seven valence electrons around it. So these are both nonmetals. They do not want to give up their electrons. So phosphorus isn't going to give any electrons to chlorine. Chlorine is not going to give any electrons to phosphorus. So if these are to form a molecule, so we'd want to check to see if they do or not. And yes, they do. Um, and so if they are to form a molecule, they're going to have to share their electrons with each other. And so we can show this momentarily anyways, by saying, okay, if phosphorus shares its electron with chlorine. And so again, it's going to be not transferring it over, but it's going to be sharing that electron with chlorine and chlorine is going to be sharing its electron with phosphorus. So now chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons of its own. Plus it's counting this one as its eighth electron. So chlorine has achieved its full outer shell. It's complete octet. It's stable. It's happy. It's done. But you'll notice phosphorus now. Let's do that in a different color. Um, it has one, two, let's go here, three, four, five of its own electrons. And it's going to count this one that it's sharing with uh, chlorine over here. It's going to count it as its sixth electron. That's the idea with sharing, right? You have access to the your own electron plus the one you're sharing with that, that other atom. So it has six electrons. It is not yet stable. So in order to get it to be stable, it would have to combine with another chlorine. So we'd have our, let's see if I can get the color working here, chlorine, our second chlorine with one, two, three, four, I'm going to go five, six, seven, playing a little bit around with the placement so that I can do show my sharing a little bit better. So it has its seven electrons. And then again, let's do uh, this one in yellow. It's able to share these, that's what I wanted, these two electrons here. So now it can count that other electron as phosphorus's seventh electron, almost there. Now this chlorine is not going to do any more, right? Because it is now stable. It now has its own, let's do that in green again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it's going to count that one as its eighth electron. So this chlorine is stable. It's happy. It's got eight around it. Phosphorus though is still sitting at seven. So we will need another chlorine around it. And again, when you react to things like phosphorus and, and, and chlorine, you're going to have all sorts of them. So the question is, how many of them will it take to get the atoms stable? And I'm going to put the seven electrons around chlorine like so. And uh, let's do this one in red. Um, and so it's going to be able to share do that. Share another pair here. And again, um, chlorine is going to have its stable eight. And now phosphorus has this electron from the third chlorine as its eighth electron. So now phosphorus is happy as well. So the molecule that forms when phosphorus and chlorine react, and again, we're, we're drawing chlorine atoms here. It would start off probably as a molecule, but it would end up as a three chlorines to each phosphorus here, the molecule would have one phosphorus and three chlorines. And so we would show that in our formula. We'd say, okay, there's one phosphorus and there are three of these chlorines um, being shared in there. And, we, and uh, we'd have our molecule. Um, now this gets pretty messy. So what we do to straighten things up a little bit is that we say, okay, this shared pair of electrons between let's say the phosphorus and the chlorine on the bottom here, we're going to represent that with, instead of drawing two dots with a circle around them, we're going to draw a line. So that line is a covalent bond. So for each of these circled electrons, get rid of the numbers and everything. So we, we did have two electrons, one from each, and we circled them. 
to simplify things, what we do is we just draw a line between the phosphorus and the chlorine. And that line represents the shared pair of electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of each of these. And it's not a line and the electrons. It is just the line. So you end up with the each pair of electrons that is being shared between atoms represented by a single line. It replaces the circle and the dots, and that is the covalent bond. So the line is used to represent a shared pair of electrons. That's the covalent bond. That is what holds a molecule together. You can have multiple bonds. And so imagine for oxygen gas. Now oxygen gas has the, let's do this a little bit smaller so we can fit some more things on here. Oxygen gas has the formula O2. So if we were to draw a, a Lewis dot diagram, a single oxygen would have one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to put the sixth one here. It's a column 16, so it has six valence electrons. So it needs to share two more. Now, what you could do is you could say, okay, well, let's take an, another oxygen. And we want to show this sharing with it. So we could say, okay, let's circle these two electrons to show that those two oxygens will share those two electrons. So that's one shared pair. And then in order to get to eight, they're going to have to share another pair of electrons. So this oxygen gas molecule, O2, is going to be made up of two oxygens. And if they do that, again, let's do the count off here. They've got one, two, three, four, five, six of their own electrons that they started with, plus seven, eight that they're sharing with that other oxygen. And they don't take them away from that oxygen, so that, that other oxygen still has access, still is able to count those that seven and eight electron as their own as well. So that first oxygen is stable. It's good. And again, the same thing for the other one. It's going to be stable as well. Now, that's, that's pretty messy. So again, what we do is we replace our circle and our two dots, our shared pair of electrons, and we just draw a line. And I'm going to replace this one as well. And we keep the lines right between the atoms. So instead of drawing continuously more and more, like connecting one auction and another auction, another auction, what you can do is you can get it to work out in a way that gives you, in this case here, two shared pairs of electrons. In this case, we've got a double bond. This is covalently bonded to oxygen, atoms covalently bonded together, and it, it does it through two shared pairs, and therefore it is a double bond. With um, nitrogen gas, do this as our last example here. So nitrogen gas, again, is in column 15, so it's going to have five valence electrons around it. Um, and let's say I didn't know the formula for nitrogen gas, so I can say, okay, well, one, two, three, four. So I, I need, I know that this, this first nitrogen on the left here is going to, it's got five electrons. It needs three more. Um, and so what I could do is I could combine it with another nitrogen and I could share a pair of electrons like so. Now, instead of adding a, another nitrogen over here to share again with, um, what I could, should try to do is try filling it out with that original nitrogen first. So let's put my electrons in there. So they each have five. They share one pair, two pair three pair of electrons and now count them up original five plus three that are being shared each one has eight electrons around it they're both have full octets they're both stable they're both happy we're done let's clean this up a bit by replacing the circle and the two dots each of them there is three shared pairs so we just put three bonds between them and voila we have a triple bond